Hello and welcome to my Nagging Thoughts series on theological sexism where I am doing a compare and contrast between Christian and Islamic theologies as it concerns marriage. And this is the final installment. I will put links to all the citations that I am mentioning in the description below so that you can verify everything for yourself. Now, Let's just talk about the concept of gendered authority outside the context of marriage. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3 um, is a passage that addresses church fashion, and it says the head of the woman is the man. And it says that as the basis to pass on a tradition of women physically covering their head while praying or prophesying in church without regard to marital status. Now, to be fair, this passage does add a qualifier in verse 6 that this principle is only applicable so long as society considers it disgraceful for a woman to cut or shave her hair. But unlike the Sunnah Hadith that provide context for verses revealed in the Quran that only serve to reinforce the clarity of the authority and power dynamics between the genders, the rest of this chapter in the Bible refutes the notion that um, head coverings are a sign of man's authority over woman. First Corinthians chapter 11 verse 2 makes it clear that this practice was not um, part of the other fundamental traditions that were already previously passed on that Paul was praising this church for faithfully practicing. So whatever your interpretation is of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 1 through 16, verse 2 makes it clear that this is not a fundamental Christian tradition. And verse 16 also makes it clear that this is not an issue that Christians should spend time quarreling about. Nonetheless, far from prohibiting women from praying and prophesying at church on the basis that the first woman came from the first man, this passage clearly outlines a procedure for women to do exactly that. And it even goes so far as to point out that the there is a level playing field between the genders who, um, uh, and, and that it is God who has supremacy in giving life. And you can see that in verses 11 and 12. Now I want to point out while 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 1 through 16 are about fashion rules that apply to praying and prophesying in church, the fact is that praying is an act of petitioning God and that prophesying is an act of speaking on behalf of God. Approaching God on behalf of people is the function of a priest. And Hebrews chapter 7 verse 24 through 25 says that Jesus is our eternal high priest who ever lives to intercede on our behalf. So it should be obvious that intercession is inherently laden with spiritual authority. Likewise, approaching people on behalf of God is the function of a prophet. That is also a, a role that is inherently laden with spiritual authority. So whatever the fashion conditions for 1 Corinthians chapter 11 are for women in Corinth to be able to pray and prophesy at church, the fact is that this passage outlines how women of that city were to do both of those things. And that reinforces the truth that we see in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, that there is no demographic authority or hierarchy to, uh, to add, uh, that, that would functionally add to Christ's mediation role between God and humanity. This is further corroborated by the precepts that are found in places like Matthew chapter 23 verses 8 through 12 that say Christians are not to call each other by hierarchical spiritual terms such as rabbi, father, or teacher. So even in the immediate context of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it, um, it totally undermines uh, the false notion that biblical headship is for the purpose of honoring a categorical, hierarchical, spiritual authority between the genders within corporate worship. Even if you disagree with me, the fact that I'm able to appeal to this very same chapter to challenge a man-exalting theology as an eisegesis that imposes tradition onto the text is in radical contrast to the Quran, who's clear and consistent understanding of headship, authority, and power is only further confirmed and clarified by investigating context, um, which was meticulously documented by re reliable Sahih and Sunnah Islamic sources. 
before I dive into that uh, contrast, I want to be fair and mention Quran 3, 195 that does say that the work of a Muslim martyr will not be lost, whether it's done by a male or a female, to the point that it will cancel out their evil deeds. But Allah's acceptance of martyrdom here does not mean that all deeds done by men and women are equal in authority or value before Allah. Just the fact that a wife must please her husband who has the authority to decide her eternal destination is evidence of that. As a reminder, in Sahih al-Bukhari 29, um, we see how Muhammad testified why it is that he saw the vast majority of people in hell are women. This is a reliable Sunnah Hadith, and it uh, says that a woman asked Muhammad, why the vast majority of people in hell are women when she asked, quote, do they disbelieve in Allah or are they ungrateful to Allah? He replied, they are ungrateful to their husbands. But the disparity in the values of human gender before Allah is further corroborated in places like Quran 2, 228, that says Allah made men a degree above women and Quran 434 that says men are in charge of women. Surah 434 even outlines a three-step progressive discipline procedure that culminates in corporal punishment to get the wife to quote obey you. Because of that categorical authority, a Muslim man's work carries more value before Allah. And if there's any doubt of that, all we need to do is just take a look at Islamic heaven, which is designed to appeal to the hedonistic uh man because uh the reward that you're enticed with for good behavior is that you can earn up to 72 female virgin houris with quote firm swelling breasts these uh, kinds of rewards uh not only present no eternal value to heterosexual women but for the wife who actually beat the odds to actually make it into Islamic heaven, it actually demotes her with as much as uh, as much as a two thousand four hundred percent increase in competition for her husband's time and attention, who now has access to even better caliber options than the maximum number of simultaneous wives that were permitted to him while he was on earth. So obviously, Allah does not have equal concern uh, for the genders when it comes to eternal rewards. Ironically, now, when Muhammad explained why the vast majority of people in hell are women, he said it's because when a wife finds something she doesn't like in her husband, she will say, quote, I have never received anything good from you. But that very same hadith explains that this is precisely how Allah will treat all of her good works when he sends her to hell for all of eternity if her husband finds fault with her gratitude. The fact that a Muslim husband's gratitude towards his wife has absolutely no parallel bearing on his eternal destination shows what little value a wife has before Allah. In fact, several Islamic sources explicitly confirm that wives are, quote, toys for men, so that um, they are um, such tempting sexual objects that even if they just leave the house, a woman is considered ara, which is something that needs to be concealed because of how alluring it is for Satan to see it out in the open. So it's something like private part. That's, that's how Allah sees women. Uh, for the sake of expediency, I'm going to direct you to the um, article that's linked from answering-islam.org uh, for the full list of Islamic sources um, and citations to sa substantiate all these principles that I just mentioned. But the bottom line is that when the Bible says that the man is the head of the wife, it is in no way referring to the same principles of marital headship that is found in the Quran. For my hard-hearted Christian friends that persist in following the stubborn, self-serving theological inclinations of their own hearts, I will once again confirm that Ephesians 5 says that the husband is the head of the wife, but the immediate context is a call to mutual submission, which renders a power-hungry interpretation of headship useless. Now, the larger context of the whole council of the Bible says 
things like the first will be last and whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And that only serves to further weaken the value of understanding headship as a position of authority, as it is clearly understood to be by the Quran. Now, again, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says that the husband is the head of the wife, but the immediate context appeals to the interdependence of the genders and the supremacy of Christ. So again, the value of headship that would be that would cause a woman to physically cover her head in a Christian church has absolutely no correlation to the Islamic value of headship that empowers a man to use physical force to get what he wants from his wife and even send her to hell for all of eternity if she fails to be grateful for that kind of an exercise of leadership and authority. <laughs> um, okay, so let's deal with the last bi a biblical citation that I promised to address in this final contrast portion on gendered hierarchical authority in marriage. And that is 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 35, that says, if a, wa a wife wants to find out about something, they should ask their husbands at home because it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in church. As a reminder, the immediate context is chaotic church services. Now, we already established that three chapters earlier, this same author sanctions women praying and prophesying at church. So it is not possible that the meaning of this verse is a prohibition against women actually using their voice in church. The context of this chapter is about unruly church services and that immediate context couple, coupled with the larger context of this book of Corinthians makes it clear that the issue was that the women in Corinth were attempting to use the power of peer pressure to morally flex on their husbands. Given the physical disparities between the genders, it really makes sense to me why a wife might want to turn a church service into a public trial to interrogate a believing husband who might feel under moral compulsion to not flex his natural physical advantage over her. But this is not only not the purpose of public worship, it's just another form of flexing authority and to bully someone into submission. And given that the Bible treasures weakness and meekness over strength and power, even if it comes from numbers, it is consistent that wives were commanded to deal with their marital issues at home in a chapter addressing absolute chaos that was transpiring at that church in Corinth. When I read the types of corrections that were given to this church, it sounds like the Maury show where you can't even make out what people are saying because there's so many people simultaneously yelling and wanting to get into fist fights. <laughs> Uh, but I'm sad to report that I haven't heard uh, much Christian preaching that clearly exegetes 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 35, even in complementary churches that allow women to lead prayer, read scripture, or lead worship music, and, but still forbid them from preaching or teaching if men are present in any capacity other than an exclusively supervisory role. I can point you to episodes 1, 2, five and 13 of my nagging thoughts clapback series on what the Bible has to say about women preaching, uh, where I rolled up my sleeves to follow the evidence and the testimony of the whole council of the word of God to exegete first Corinthians chapter 14, verse 35. And I can also say that even if you're a hyper complementarian that believes that God really can't stand to hear a woman's voice within the body of Christ, I can say that there, this that situation is still a step above the Islamic concept of woman being Ara um, that needs to be covered up to the degree that Allah finds it more moral for her to pray at home than at the mosque. And I'm going to direct you to um, another article from answering-islam.org um, entitled Women in Islam for um, the Islamic sources to back that up, to substantiate that, as well as more um, information on the concept of women in Islam and the, um, the Islamic source uh, foundation for those uh, theologies. Okay, um, that is going to conclude the contrast portion of authority in marriage between the Bible and the Quran for this series. And I do hope that you will join me next time where I'm going to contrast the intelligence and moral capacities of the genders. Until then, I do want to thank you very much for in investing 
the time in hearing my nagging thoughts and to meditate deeply on the Bible. I hope that our time together spent comparing and contrasting doctrines and worldviews helps to serve God's purpose to complete the good work that he began in us collectively as the body of Christ so that we might be purified from all forms of unrighteousness and idolatry that have been smuggled in by the traditional ways that seem naturally right to humanity but in the end lead to death. I look forward to seeing you um, and your thoughts in the comments and uh, I also look forward to seeing you next episode. Until then, God bless.